come things. Tonight, new plays from Paul Mullen, Vincent Delaney, Elizabeth Heffron, Scott Augustin, and Anita Montgomery. Poetry from Charles Leggett, The Sandbox Players, and music from Jose Juicy Gonzalez and the Sandbox Radio Orchestra. <laughs> journey through the world of Sandbox Radio Live. There are bureaucracies you cannot know about. Bureaucracies which in turn barely know about you. And yet, and yet, the gears of their working turn in gears, turning gears, clockwise and counter, clockwise and counter, turning in turn your gears too. Upstairs wants this case clear or closed before the 25th. Why? You're asking me. Not that it matters, but yeah, I guess it matters. A rush might mean a different approach. We're shorthanded and maxed. Aren't you chubs always? Not like this, no. You didn't hear it from me, but for some reason the flip's important. <sighs> Fits in down the line. Quasi-apocalypse shit and so forth. The clockwork ostensibly turns on this kid. Somewhere down the line. Just what you Seth say when you don't want to say. Upstairs wants, down the line. The flip fits in the clockwork. You understand? You couldn't possibly understand. Done? Always quasi-apocalypse shit, but never quite actually apocalypse, you know? You have time for this? I sure don't. Right, rush. You got a jacket on the flip? There. Shit! That's what it is. You're not serious. You're serious? Afraid so. This is ugly, side. I got nothing for this. Nothing? We are very short-handed. I haven't had the talent for this on staff in... What? A while. So no, then? Mostly no, yeah. Mostly no. That'll sell well upstairs. Or give me a Markheim. <laughs> Sell that upstairs. That hasn't sold in a long time, Chuck. Times change, Seth. Times are tough. And there's a clockwork, you say, which the flip fits into, and I got nothing to flip with. Cut me loose some more time. You wouldn't know what to do with one. From what I hear, I wouldn't need to. I'll see what I can sell. <laughs> There's the jacket on the flip. 
You're gonna open it? Not necessary. I see it. I got it. Oh. What I don't see is why you need me. We do. I do. You chubs getting bored or soft? Neither. We're short-staffed. Don't really have the talent for something this overt. And the flip fits in a clockwork. Don't they all? I wouldn't know. You can say that again. Yes or no. Sure. Okay. Something to do, I guess. I'll need your ticket. Really? Really. Any particular reason? It's gotten tight over there. Counter smoke's a bitch. Your cover is you got no cover. You're nobody. If you're blown, you're on your own. And no ticket back. Is that a deal breaker? There'd have to be a deal to break. I can understand your concerns, but I'm afraid our holding your ticket is non-negotiable. You're hilarious. I'm not kidding. Oh, I know. You're hilarious because you're convinced I care. I would care your shoes. I know you would, sweetheart. I know. <laughs> there. Now you can rest in peace. You'll get it back. Sure I will. Listen, we don't care if you have to abort. Just don't get blown and you can come back. It's okay to fail so long as I don't blow my cover, which is nothing. Right. And if I do? Well? You'll have my ticket. Right. So I'm stuck over there. Right. The wandering Jew solution. Essentially. Glad to see you guys still sticking with the classics. <laughs> You gonna shoot me? Where did you come from? How the fuck did you get in that chair? That chair was empty when I came in here. I had to have seen you. I can't tell you what to see. I can tell you, though, that if you're gonna bring a piece on a job, you should have a round racked ahead of time. It's just sloppy not to. Who knows what you're gonna run into and how much time you'll have to react. <laughs> Shit, listen to me. Forget it, I'm just talking. Don't get me talking. No good ever came of it. You really should shoot me, you know. Why? Because I'm a... I'm a bad influence. <laughs> you should at least try shooting me. Too much noise. You got a knife on you? Yeah, I got a knife. Use that. I try not to kill psychos. You ever kill anybody? Believe it. I'm having trouble. There's a first time for everything. Not everything. Did that one see your face? What? When you were turning this place over, did it see your face? It? The twist on the floor, duct taped? Took you by surprise, didn't it? Caught your face? Yeah. Well, can't let that stand. I didn't. Oh, you mean knocking it out? Taping it up? Yeah. Chicken shit temporary solution. You're gonna have to do it. Do what? And you were right. Use the knife. And you? Me? Nah, you blew the chance with that. What? Flip, kill the twist. Use the knife. Do it fast. This ain't the movies. They don't stay unconscious for hours. <laughs> Slash the neck all the way through both the windpipe and the jugular. Both. Then leave the knife in the heart for safekeeping. Those gloves were smart. See, you're smart. You know what you're doing. Do the right thing. The right the thing? The smart thing. The only thing. Do it now. Doesn't seem like... You think there's a god? What? Hell no. Well, there is. I've met him. <laughs> and he's an angrier, uglier, brutaler motherfucker than you could ever hope to meet. He wants this. Trust me. He wants you to know what this feels like. He made you for this. You know at least that much in your dumb guts. You think I'm lying, but you know it's true. Do it. Slash it. Stick it. Get a taste. Stick your tongue in for a taste. You know you want to. You know what'll happen if you do. Just the beginning. What? That ain't me. You have no idea what's you. What you could do. How far you could go. Unstoppable. You could be like him. And he wants that for you. Who are you? I'm your worst nightmare, Flip. I know. And? And it doesn't matter. No. It doesn't matter. No, it does. <laughs> Oh, my God! Shit. What's happening? Shit. What's happening to your face? Hell if I know, you tell me. You can't see that? See what? You're glowing. Illusion. Trick. I can... I can barely look at you. So don't look at me. Listen to me. 
Close your eyes and slash the neck. You don't see that! Ask me if I care! You're something... holy, aren't you? It's just a glow, fl glow flip. You'll get over it. No! I'll never get over this. You saved me. Bullshit! I did everything I could not to. Yeah. Yeah, because you knew that was the only thing that would work. I didn't know shit. Only you. I like to talk. I talk shit on and on. I don't even know what I'm saying. That's what they sent me. I'm a Markheim. It's what I do. Can't help it. You're a miracle worker. And you're an idiot. <laughs> we don't get to choose our lot in life. That was fast. It's always fast. I wouldn't know. Yeah. Well, thanks. Save it, Chubb. Okay. There's your ticket. Yeah. Keep it. I can't keep it. It's yours. Job's gone. Done. Time to go home. You mean the fix? I mean home. You can't get there without your ticket. I said keep it. This is a problem, Mark. I'm... Maybe, but it's not mine. I'm done with the fix. I'm gonna have to take this upstairs. Yeah? Yeah. Do me a favor. Yeah? You take it as far up as it can go. You picked a nice spot. Yeah? Yeah. What do they call it? Seattle. <laughs> Never heard of it. No reason why you should have. And this spot, what do they call this spot, Bez? Harbor Steps. Well, that makes sense at least. Yeah. So how long you think they'll let you just wander around over here on Chaparral? Why should they care? They always get what they want. Maybe. But they ain't crazy about the unexpected. They'd kill the golden goose? They'd done stupider. True that. Killed goldener. Yeah. Yeah, they have. And, you know, if you're not on assignment over here... What? Well... What? I mean, who's saying Sam can't scoop you up? Nobody. Or take you out? He's had opportunities prior. When you were on jobs, he may not see it the same, you being a tourist. Sam and I go way back. That's what everybody says about Sam. Really? Really. Well? What? Life's a bitch and then you die. You wish. Markheim. <laughs> The following message is brought to you by HamfordChallenge.org. So, finals are over, huh? Life's the bomb! Not exactly. What do you mean? You got the whole summer stretched out before you like a yoga mat! Yeah, that's just it. See, it's like all of a sudden it's way too quiet. There's nothing major to worry about, you know? I need that adrenaline rush. You want something to worry about? Yeah. Something intractable. Something that's not easy to solve. Follow me to my helicopter. Your what? Whoa! Wow! Where are we going? Eastern Washington! See down there? That's the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Home to the largest radioactive waste site in the Western Hemisphere. It's where they made the plutonium for atom bombs. Where's the waste? I don't see anything but sagebrush and jackrabbits. The worst of it? It's stored underground. And now, there's millions of gallons of the stuff leaking through to the water table. Eventually, it'll end up contaminating the Columbia River. No way! Way! Man, that's bad. <laughs> what are they building over there? That's the vit plant. The what? Vitrification plant. The government wants to make glass logs out of the worst of the waste so they can store it long-term. Well, that sounds promising. 
Yeah, except the process is highly experimental. It's never been done before with this level of dangerous waste. And the contractor just fired their head of safety and research. Why? Because he raised concerns about the design of the plant. Isn't that his job? Yes. He's afraid the way it's going, when they start the plant, it could lead to an event. An event? What kind of event? A hydrogen gas explosion, like what happened in Japan. No shit! Yeah! Is this intractable enough for you? Uh, I'm getting airsick. Let's go back. Wow. Well, now you got me really worried. That's what you wanted, right? Right. But how do I take action? I hate stuff like the world's gonna end and there's nothing you can do about it. There is something you can do. There are groups fighting to make sure the cleanup goes the way it should. Like who? Like Hanford Challenge a small but mighty nonprofit working to keep the public informed and active on the whole issue. Hanford Challenge. I'll check them out. Just go to HanfordChallenge.org and read up. Yeah, thanks. Now my summer's totally screwed. <laughs> You're welcome. Find out what's cooking in Washington's own backyard. Visit HanfordChallenge.org today. Actor's Resume by Charles Leggett. Epigraph. Nature uses the instrument of human fantasy in order to pursue her works of creation on a higher level. The Father, Pirandello's six characters in search of an author. The only thing worse than not getting an erection when you want one, quips John Worthing, sipping champagne, is getting one when you don't. <laughs> Elliot Chase snickers over his martini. Mirabelle grins through thick streams of pipe smoke, takes a swig of sherry. Deputy Governor Danforth raises an eyebrow. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Ignatievich Vershinen heaves a shot of Smirnoff and a sigh. Major Sergei Saranov scowls privately into his cognac. Pastor Manders bums a smoke from Elliot and orders another decanter of the house red as the father slams down his fist in protest. Why do you laugh? It's awful, isn't it, when you don't have control? Oh, dear. Moans Elliot, suppressing a giggle. Control over what? Queries Danforth, his eyes narrowing in a leer. An unconscious Bob Akers belches underneath the table. Good heavens, mutters Jack. Control over appetite? Offers Vershinen with a guffaw. Or execution? Adds Danforth with a yellow-toothed grin. Sergius cackles violently and slaps the barmaids behind as she clears Bob's empty schooners. Manders nearly knocks her over, rushing to the men's room. Mirabelle buys the next round and toasts. To talk control is all quite well and good. A woodpecker is not without the wood. Some birds know much more than they really should. But here's a branch you won't see understood. Hilarity erupts! <laughs> Even the father cracks a meek smile. Bob wakes up, drooling, hits his head on the table bottom. Manders' sheepish return from the bathroom to think that they, Sergius his cackle, Rasheen and his belly laugh, Elliot snickering, Jack's exclamations couched in tense giggles, the Judge Danforth's bared yellow teeth venting of shallow, unvoiced exhalations, Mirabelle's billows of pipe smoke through sherry red lips stretched in self-satisfaction, the father's wan, guilty grimace, Bob's agonized grunting, all Manders thinks must be laughing at him. Finally, Oberon arrives out of nowhere with the herb, and they all vanish into the forest.
Notes from the Workplace by Vincent Delaney. I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. I am an unattractive man. It's affected my outlook on work. <laughs> Nathan, what are you doing with all these books? I'm filing them, Charles. That's a dumpster. You're putting our books in a dumpster. Well, most of these are badly written. <laughs> I think we need to talk. After the library fired me, I couldn't stop myself. I was sick, and I knew it. I lost nine jobs for cheating, for stealing, for pr provoking the owner's cats, once for insubordination, which was odd, since no one knew what I really thought of them. Nathan, do you like customer service? Why do you ask, Meg? Your face often seems, well, contorted. I have a prosthesis, Meg. <laughs> I think we need to talk. I floated for a time. I wondered why. Was it some sick thrill? Did I honestly just not like people? Why did I find so many ways to provoke them? Excuse me, Nathan. I hate to bother you. It's just some of the callers feel like you're a touch surly. They need to toughen up, Liz. <laughs> This is a crisis prevention center. Sometimes suicide is the best choice. What did you just say? If you're fat and you're ugly, what's the point? I think we need to talk. I was an addict. 37 jobs. I raced to interviews. Not wanting the job, but giddy at the thought of how they would one day fire me. What was I doing? <laughs> I needed to clear my head. I decided to tutor exchange students. Uh, are you taller than your friend? No, my friend is taller than me. That was completely wrong, Carlo. Nathan, I am so sorry. Do you want to learn this language? Are you even trying? Please, correct me. There's no point. Uh, no, please. I owe money to the coyotes. I have to pay them. My family needs me. That is my only hope. Teach me English. First of all, it's not, are you taller than your friend? It's, is you taller than you friend be? <laughs> is you, excuse me? Is you taller than you friend be? Say it. Is you taller than you, friend B? No, mine friend is taller than me is. Are you sure, Nathan? Who's the native speaker here? I shall never learn English. Not with that attitude. Ex excuse me, Nathan. Mr. Jackson. I think we need to talk. Some men want to date hundreds of women. I understand, although it's morally weak. I would only need one woman. I've never had one, but that's all I would need. I want this. I can't help it. I like it. The moment when your coworkers inch away ever so slightly as you sit in your cube, the dread in your stomach, the need to sit on the toilet and lose everything? Why do I crave that? Why do I love it when the manager suddenly realizes I'm the cockroach that crept into his kitchen and his next move would surely be to crush me? The look in his eyes, the dream of it, I want to be that cockroach over and over again. It's so much work to live this dream. <laughs> Okay, now Carl here gets along fine with Coco, Diggers, and Spike. Carl does not get along with Butters. Do you have that? Carl likes Coco, Diggers. And Spike. Carl does not like Butters. No, Carl will rip Butters' face off and devour it if he gets the chance. Did they used to date? You have references, right? Oh, absolutely. Just call the shelter. They know me. 
I, I'm there all the time. So, here are the leashes. <laughs> Color coded. You'll notice each is a varying length based on the aggression level of the dog. The angriest dog has the really short leash. That would be butter. No, not butters. Butters is sweet. I'm talking about Carl. I was just testing you, Debbie. Okay. Most important issue, you leash Butters last and keep her on the long leash, way out in front. She starts to slack off, you call her name. You say, go, Butters, try it. Go, Butters. No, really say it. Go, Butters! Okay. For your first time, I'm going to just wait here. You take one turn around the block, see how you do. Once around the block. Once only. Nathan, these are really important dogs. I got it, Debbie. I felt so free. A handful of leashes, the wind in the air, all the power concentrated in my hand. I thought of the human race and how much better it could be like this. But mostly, I thought of Carl and Butters. Carl and Butters. What had happened between them? What was the unresolved pain? The words left unsaid, the bitter hope stash. Had they truly loved and there was betrayal? It was wrong to let the questions hang. They needed closure. I wanted to provide it for them. Stay, Butters. Don't run from it. Go, Carl. Oh, It's a small room, not even a studio. I can reach all four walls if I stretch, but I don't because exercise is debilitating. I see 40-year-old men jogging, their bodies broken by exercise, limping, withered. I see the realization in their eyes. If they'd never once exercised, they'd still have a future. I don't like my room. I could afford more, but I like how I don't like it. I like the spite that comes to me in the night when I hear the laughter next door, the gentle voices. They don't know I'm here, a part of their wall or their ceiling or their floor. They don't know all the things I hear. They have a cockroach, each of them suspended in their midst. I wish they would crush me. Sometimes I walk, I don't know why, in the park past the mob of joggers. Hi. Excuse me? Just saying hi. <laughs> Who do they think they are? Talking to me like that. I was rattled. I needed to pick me up. I went to a job fair. Oh my gosh, Hello. Hi, Anna! I'm Nathan! Goodness! We have a self-starter here. His name is Nathan. Not afraid to put his best foot forward. Nathan, why don't you come on up to this microphone? Come on up! We're all in this together! Everyone, give Nathan some encouragement! Yay! That, that is the spirit! That is the way to get every person in this room a job! A decent job! A job with benefits! A job with mobility! What do you say? Yes! Like everyone here, Nathan is out there early every morning, on the streets, on the internet, sending the emails. Is he updating his resume on a daily basis? He is! Does he research the company before he makes initial contact? He does! Will his hard work pay off with a high-quality interview that is guaranteed to leave a strong impression with the employer? It will! Nathan, this is your moment. I know there are some employers out there right now. No pressure for a go-getter like you. Tell us all, your fellow job seekers, your future boss, tell us your best quality. I've been fired 47 times. Let's move on. I watch the joggers race by. 
The young mothers and their spandex? The sleek racing strollers? I wish they could see the terror in the stricken faces of their babies. <laughs> Strapped in, facing the fear of high speed alone, how is jogging helping them? <sighs> Excuse me. Hi. Hello there. Hi. <laughs> Are you talking to me? <sighs> I see you sit out here sometimes when I'm jogging. Thought I'd say hi. I'm Bree. I'm busy. You don't look busy. What's your name? Nathan. Every morning I pass you when I jog and I feel like you look a little sad. So, thought I'd stop and just say hi. And you know, well, Cheer up, Nathan. You should cheer up a little. What did you say to me? I'm just saying, life is good. And I thought you should hear it. Have a good morning. Gotta move. I seethed. I felt the hottest rage ripping at my brain. I walked, I stumbled into bars, I drank, I kicked things. How dare she? I felt violated. There are social rules, and she shattered them all. In one moment of arrogance, she robbed me of my dignity. You look like crap. You want another drink? Let me ask you something. If, if you hired me and I, I stole a beer, would you fire me? Nah, I do that stuff. If you hired me and I stole a beer and I beat up a customer, would you fire me then? Probably give you a medal. If I did all those things, and I slept with your wife and your sister, and I did it at the same time, and I did it here in the bar while your parents were playing pool, and your mother wanted to join in too, so I let her, would you fire me? You're cut off. <laughs> I wandered all night. I don't know what happened. I think a car hit me, but it was a spongy bumper, and I passed out on the street, and later, crows dragged me away. Look, it's a dead body. Awesome. Is it really dead? Well, it's not completely dead, but I think it's mainly dead, like roadkill. Roadkill is totally dead. <laughs> roadkill can only be sorta of dead. That's how it gets back off the road. You think he's roadkill? Oh, my head. Run! No! Oh. We can't just run, he's hurt. Sir, are you hurt? He's got blood all over him. I'm going! Stop! <laughs> We're gonna help him. Can I help you? Why are you talking to me? Well, you're hurt. You're bleeding. Why are people being so nice to me? You need help. We want to help you. You're a person. I couldn't take this. <laughs> the entire universe was against me. All this kindness, this compassion. I felt so small, so impotent. My mind seethed with spite as I wandered through the city. You're actually still standing here. I looked at that little girl's eyes, brown and open and trusting, and everything changed. I saw a different place. I saw hope. It, it was an odd space, but I, I saw myself in it. Maybe I wasn't sick. Maybe I could be someone. I wandered through the city. Actually, you're still here. <laughs> What's happening to me? I don't know. You got hit on the head? I've been so despicable. I've been vain glorious. Which means? I'm a jerk. And I'm so sorry. I have to go. I'm not supposed to talk to bleeding adults. <laughs> the world seemed so new. I thought of the stupidity, the jobs I had sacrificed, the wasted time. 
I thought of simple acts of kindness, the greatest mystery there is. I thought of Brie. Would I see her? Would she speak to me? I had to know. The park. My bench, but not my bench. A new hope, maybe a new life. I saw the sky, early morning sun, the shimmer on the lake. I saw the joggers, fit, lean, focused, so healthy, so strong, so certain. Look at them, running before work, sweat streaming in their eyes, cocksure, proud, productive members of society flaunting their health. And I realized something so profound, so true. I really hate these people. <laughs> I want to ruin things. I want to tear everything I see. It's a drug, this feeling. I need more of it. I'm on this bench waiting for Brie. I can hardly breathe, I'm so excited. I'm missing work. I'll probably get fired, which only adds to the excitement. <laughs> I won't move until I see her. There's something I want her to know. I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. I am an unattractive man. And I like it. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh. Here we, here we go now. Hip, ha. Make democracy. What? Ha. Make democracy. Yeah. Ha. Make democracy. What? Ha. Make democracy. Yeah. The following interlude is brought to you by the Citizens at Guiding Lights Network. Mm. Sometimes. Uh, yeah. Sometimes. Uh, yeah. You see what's wrong in the street, in the house next door, at the corner store. And you want to go down and fix it, lend a hand and tell the man. But that ain't so easy, no, not anymore. Everybody on the laptop, hammering on the phone. Look around the block, ain't nobody home. You sign the same petition five damn times, and nothing happens, nothing moves, nothing adds to nothing, and you're stuck in the same groove. Some folks, they want to sit back and blame. Well, don't do that to shit for the pain. Because it takes a civil action to set the civil course and stop the evasion, ease the frustration, change the equation, build a foundation for democracy. Huh? Huh. Make democracy. What? Huh. Make democracy. Yeah. Since 2005, the Guiding Lights Network has been helping the people of Seattle do what they do best. Organize, gather, debate, engage. We bring citizens together to encourage, inspire, and teach each other the most effective ways to be passionate advocates for our communities and find caring, effective solutions for living in a complex world. Ah. Some folks, they like their washing the side, say that they don't end no way to survive. Cause it takes a civil action to step, a civil cause, and generate traction. What the reaction, fairness in action, constructive faction for democracy. What? Huh. Make democracy, yeah, ha. Make democracy, what? Uh. To Make join democracy. our network and find yeah. more ways to be an effective citizen for your community and your world, go to guidinglightsnetwork.com and make democracy. Yeah. Huh. Make democracy, what? Yeah. Make democracy, yeah, ha. Huh. Make democracy, what? Ha. Huh. Make democracy, yeah. Irreducible Howard by Elizabeth Heffern. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here to witness the most mundane and astounding event in the universe, the birth, life, and death of one Howard Alphonse Gautenecht. <laughs> Little 
No fetal Howard, baby. Come on now. Stop clinging. It's time for your big splashy entrance. <laughs> Yeah, sugar. You can't stay up here with us angels, twiddling your tootsie all day. You gotta go down to that blue-green orb and make your way. Born on a gunmetal gray day in September 1945, Howard was hurled to Earth in a dingy naval hospital in San Leandro, California, while his mother, a secret communist sympathizer, pushed her hardest in the opposite direction. Ah! Go back! Go back! Mrs. Galtanecht! Go back, Howard! You're gonna hate it out here! Mrs. Galtanecht, please! You're delirious! Knock her out, nurse! Yes, doctor. <laughs> and wash that kid up. He looks like he's been swimming in cough syrup. Yes, Doctor. A shy child from an industrial suburb with a large Christian science population, Howard spent his early years battling hearing loss and playing hide-and-seek with his friends in the shadow of a Nobisco plant. 98, 99, 100, ready or not, here I come. What? I said, ready or not, here I come. What? I said, ready or not, here I come. Howard's teenage years were filled with the usual acne, existential angst, and pathetic attempts at sexual understanding. What is that? You know what it is, Howard. No, I don't. Sure you do. Well, I don't see why everybody calls it a pie. It doesn't look anything like pie. Eventually, Howard found his high school niche as second clarinetist in the marching band and senior class treasurer where he passed out piggy banks that pooped pennies as part of his campaign. Vote for Howard Gautenacht! Vote for Howard Gautenacht! You'll save in the end! He went on to study business at UC Berkeley in the late 1960s, where he missed the summer of love completely, selling hot dogs in Santa Cruz, and spent his last two years barricaded in the office of his favorite economics professor to avoid being swept into the growing student protests. Ho, ho, Ho Chi Minh! Vietnam is going to win! Ho. Protest, schmortes! They are a perfect example of Keynesian dynamics. Look at the t-shirts they are selling. The rolling papers! Look at the rising price of sage. Keynesian dynamics. I tell you, Howard, where there is tumult, there is money to be made. Industrial contracts, yeah? Do you hear me, Herr Gaffnecht? Yes, Professor, I think so. Basically, it's your supposition that chaos equals cash, correct? Boom, da -da! You get an A! Yippee! Howard married Kitty Boombottom, a bubbly young Nixon supporter and minor kleptomaniac in 1971. <laughs> After honeymooning on the Long Beach Peninsula, where he and Kitty drank double daiquiris by a peanut-shaped pool and toured the local aquarium, Howard went to work for IBM in Houston, Texas, and settled in for the long haul. Well, this is it, Kitty. What's it, Howard? This, this is it. We're settling in for the long haul. We are? Absolutely. Well, in that case, Howard, I'll need an in-home vacuum cleaner and a trash compactor. Over the years, Howard and Kitty had two healthy children, a girl and a boy, and then one that was stillborn, which they once tried to talk about after dinner as they watched the evening news, but just couldn't quite do it. Three people were killed in a horrible gardening accident today. <laughs> Howard? Yes? Do you ever... What? I can't seem to feel my feet. Oh, they're right there, Kitty. I know. I, I just can't seem to feel them anymore. You know what I mean? Let me rub them a little. No, Howard. Just a little. No, it's not about my feet. I thought you just Well, said... it's not. Oh. Never mind. Oh. That's Nancy Reagan with little Patty. Turn it up. Uh, just say no. The following year, 
Kitty was arrested at Neiman Marcus for lifting a turquoise brooch off a deeply tanned mannequin. The charges were discreetly dropped, and she was referred to a psychiatrist who put her on a series of little pink pills. I do so love my little pink pills. I don't know, Kitty. Oh, I... shut up, Howard. They're a modern miracle. Ask Dr. Labutsky. He'll tell you exactly what a miracle they are. Aside from a sudden and intense interest in Civil War reenactments, Howard took to swimming as his main hobby and release from the unspoken pressures he felt building. Back and forth, in long, deliberate strokes, he would swim across the pool, allowing his mind to float beyond the office and his output issues and the orthodontist bills to a place he felt he knew extremely well, yet had never actually been, one that was slightly erotic. Howard, let me give you a salt rub, baby. Wow. Who, who are you? Where is this place? Nowhere in Texas, sugar. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, hey, wait! Come back! Darn. On April 30th, 1988, 13 years after the fall of Saigon, still pondering the point to a salt rub, Howard stayed late at the office and had the only intimate dalliance of his entire life with a marketing intern named Mindy under a conference table. Okay, now, turn over. That's right. Watch your arm. Uh, you mean turn all the way over? Yeah, we're gonna do it the other way now. The other way? Come on, Howard, get with the program. We're blasting off. We're finding meaning in the physical. Ow! Ow! My leg! Uh, that's right, sport. There you go. Gum. Howard came home from this night of contortion, drained and exhausted. He took a shower and then another one and went to sleep on the sofa, which Kitty noted and registered as a slight chip in her heart. But due to the little blue pills she was now taking to bring her down from the little pink pills, she was unable to recognize the feeling for what it actually was. Howard? Honey? Yes? What are you doing on the sofa? There's no plastic on there. <laughs> Your body oil's gonna affect the sheen. Come back to bed. Oh, okay. <laughs> Having crossed the thin red line of morality, but finding that life stayed basically the same, he still had psoriasis and an impending sense of malaise. <laughs> Howard never dabbled in the overtly adulterous again and settled back into his long haul. Their children grew up, moved on, and eventually sued him for excess college expenses in the spring of aught three. Two years later, on a whim, he and Kitty purchased an electric golf cart, which Howard decked out in his Confederate uniform, would ram with unnecessary speed through enemy lines at reenactments. No! Howard, stop! You almost hit that Union soldier! Yeah! General Grant sucks eggs! What is the matter with you? I don't know! I don't know, Kitty! I just feel like sticking it to the man! Kitty? Kitty, are you all right? Oh, my God. Don't touch me. Where are my pills? Kitty. No, Howard. I don't want to know what this has to do with the deficit. I'm going back to the motel for happy hour. As Kitty strode angrily across the battlefield at Antietam, nursing a sore arm in her billowy summer pantsuit, Howard had an unusual urge to track her down and mount her. But he abstained and chose instead to savor this fleeting moment of exhilaration as it dawned on him for that for the first time in his life, he had willfully destroyed prop private property. Wow. I think I just willfully destroyed private property. Back in Texas, Kitty found solace in her tea party Tetris Club 
and Howard stared down his twilight years at IBM by joining Facebook and friending the entire Southeast Asian corporate subgroup. <laughs> then, two weeks before he turned 65 and four days after signing up for Medicare, Howard awoke one morning to see fantastic Chinese fireworks in one eye and two ample-bosomed angels swimming through his other. Naked and zoftig, they massaged him gently with their minds while he lay in bed beside the sleeping kitty. Howard. What? Hello, Howard. It's us again, sweetums. Kitty. Kitty, wake up, I think. An overwhelming sense of betrayal and well-being hit Howard hard like the smell of eggplant parmesan. A moment later, a second blood clot slammed into his carotid artery and sent him fully back to his angels. Oh, it's you. That's right, sugar pie. We're going home. All right, well, wait a minute. Are you saying, are you saying that was it? Yes, Howard, that was it. Come to Mama's cupcake. But wait, but what about? Oh, oh yes. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another irreducible life cycle registered, recorded, and
Dave Pascal, Rob Whitmer, and Dan Tierney. around and said, I'm in Fremont, man. He never thought before he left the USSR that he'd end up in Seattle just across from a bar. West of Lenin, west of Lenin, west of Lenin. Back in Mother Russia, no one cared for his art. To be a politician just about broke his heart. In the center of the universe, now he can be free. Where the hippies and the commies live in sweet harmony. Welcome to the microphone, Mr. Charles Leggett. the rumble in your belly you ain't had nothing to eat you so god awful hungry you eat the breadcrumbs off the street shake the chump change in your pocket you ain't got nothing more you ain't even got nothing stashed away for what your life gonna have in store and your wife she won't quit talking on that telephone how long can it take this woman just to call up and say hello and then come a knock, knock, knockin'. It's a rent man wants a check. He don't pay you, no, never mind. He just wants you to pay the debt. And the doorbell start to ringin'. It's a mailman for your wife. And the doorbell keep on ringin'. It's a milkman for your wife. You mix all this stuff together. You're trying just to do your best. You're thinking, good God almighty. Is this some kind of a test? It's a recipe.
got to rumble in your belly. You had too much to eat. Your wife spent so much time on the vegetables. She overdone cooked the meat. Shake the chump change in your pocket. Head down to the liquor store. You already had too much to drink, so what's a little more? Interference on the TV set, can't even watch the game. Calling up on them cable people, they don't want to know your name. Gunshot going off across the street, make you feel kind of blue. You stick your head out the window, and there ain't nobody there. Siren going off across the town, and make you feel kind of blue. I make you start to wonder, when are gonna come for you? You mix all this stuff together, and trying just to do your best. You're thinking, good God Almighty, is this some kind of a test? Well, it's a recipe. Recipe for stress. husband Soren by calling him Jim. It was her way of saying, what have you done to us? You don't deserve an interesting name like Soren. <laughs> now you are an ordinary Jim. Well, she called him Jim behind his back. Well, not even behind his back because she didn't have anyone to talk to him about. She, so she called him Jim to herself. Andrea and Soren had moved to the small town of Albro six months ago. No, it was more like eight. It had been spring, and all things seemed possible. It was really pretty in the spring. They had moved there because of Soren's job. Jim's job. It made sense on paper. Andrea wasn't bringing in much with her job from the bookstore. I used to dance. Was almost part of a very well-respected, locally well-respected troupe. Andrea didn't tell people this anymore because she could see the question in their eyes. Stripper? Maybe. If I had been a choreographer, I would have stayed longer in the dance world. Is there such a thing as the dance world? Our town, Albros, I call it Albatross. Again, not out loud. Andrea knew Coleridge references aren't easy. To get out of the once adorable, now claustrophobic house, Andrea started working at the library. Volunteering is working. Like most collections, Andrea started by accident. She was at the library and overheard a woman. Joan. Joan whose son fell off the ladder. Not Joan whose brother was driving the bus when the accident happened. You know, the Girl Scouts. Andrea didn't know anyone well. Conversations were short. But she, without trying, soon discovered that everyone in town was connected to some or other tragic event. She knew. Everybody in the world has some sorrow in their family. An uncle who died young, some cancer, a stroke. But the folks of Elbros, their misfortunes seemed... Freakish. <laughs> Not tidy, ordinary illness and injuries. Melanie with a thick, thick glasses. Too thick for someone in her 20s. Melanie, who couldn't master much beyond reshelving. My dad was reading the electric meter on what turned out to be a meth lab when it blew up. <laughs> <laughs> 
Leslie, who goes through romance novels like water. Leslie. My eldest son died of an infection in her mouth. No, wait, yeah. Brought on because Dr. Parker, the dentist, he used his untrained wife as a dental assistant to save money. Dr. Parker is in jail now. His wife, Anne, is a waitress over at the Pizza Hut. Kyle, the nice boy who stocks the shelves at the grocery store. My grandma lived over by the highway. A big rig lost control and drove through her house. Crushed her while she was getting a midnight snack. <laughs> Some days the stories ran together. Pit bulls, sinkholes, whiskey and short tempers. Loaded guns and abandoned appliances. Toxic exposure from the most alarming sources. A car repair put off until money wasn't so tight. Kids playing with things that they shouldn't be playing with. She thought of herself as an anthropologist. Even daydreaming that I'll go back to college and study anthropology. Like Margaret Mead. No, not her. Something happened with Margaret Mead and she's not who she used to be. Jane Goodall. No, she was chimps. Andrea imagined herself at elegant dinner parties, <laughs> telling of her findings. But Andrea had some awareness, and she knew the following. First, anecdotal evidence is flawed. To really show something, graphs and control groups and statistics would have to be brought in. Second, the brain searches for patterns. I am unconsciously looking for these terrible, chaotic occurrences. I've become sensitive to them. Third, I'm being snobby. I've constructed a very judgmental house of cards. Like I'm saying, see how carelessly these poor people live? I'm better. She did it to hover over the town. As if escape were still possible. It was inevitable that Andrea would meet Lynette. Lynette brought her two young sons to the twice-weekly story time. Lynette was thin to the point of gaunt, and Andrea could not imagine her pregnant. And not just once, but twice. <laughs> the boys weren't interested in being read to. The younger one was always chewing on something and staring off in the distances. The older one... I'm assuming he's older because of his size. He was fidgety and anxious. The library had a box of toys that the little one gnawed on and the bigger one tried to smuggle home. Andrea heard Lynette say, Justin's dad. And? Aaron's dad. So she knew the boys had different fathers. Not such a big thing. And yet, something sent Andrea's antenna up. One week after story time, a battered old car pulled up with two men. Lynette looked out the window. Justin, Aaron, your dads are here. Andrea found the fact that the fathers were so amicable. Either oddly sophisticated or awfully trashy. Jesus Christ, Bobby! You took out Justin's car seat! He still needs that! Lynette, we had to take it out so there'd be room for everybody! Yeah, Lynette, we thought you'd be happy for the ride. You assholes! You guys are out on bail! Goddamn traffic ticket could send you back to county! Judge would love to bounce you back! Shit! Never mind. Justin can ride on my lap. Next story time, Andrea managed to maneuver herself next to Lynette. <laughs> it's just great that your kids' dads are friends. Huh? You know, I saw them pull up together on Tuesday. Yeah, well, they just got the one car between them, so they're usually together. Plus, since the eviction, they're both living with their mom. Mom? Andrea was momentarily adrift. Oh, they're brothers. Yeah. Lynette picked up a Dixie cup of high C. The Haney boys. Andrea thought back to Tuesday in the words, out on bail. How could she steer the conversation to... I suppose, Lynette said with a mouthful of dry, cheap cookie. I should enjoy them while I can. <laughs> Their trial is coming up. Who knows what'll happen? Trial? Lynette shrugged. <laughs> Drugs. Oh, so Justin and Aaron, is it? Yeah. Hmm, so they're more than half-brothers? Somebody pointed out they're cousins, too. Andrea had never been great with math. <laughs> so they'd be like three-eighths brothers. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Over the next few weeks, Andrea courted Lynette, soaking up her life story. 
If Lynette found it strange that someone was interested in her life story, she never said anything. I mean, I was going with Bobby first, but we were totally broken up, and everybody says I started going with Mike to make Bobby jealous, but that is pure BS. Mike was always nice to me, and you know, he was living with us, so I'd see him every day anyway. But Mike and I broke up before I knew I was carrying Aaron, and of course, I got back together with Bobby. I mean, we were like high school sweethearts. Andrea knew she shouldn't be treating this woman's life like a soap opera. But I just can't help it. Or maybe, <laughs> or maybe she could help it, but didn't. What gets everybody so confused <laughs> is that Mike is younger than Bobby, but Aaron is older than Justin. Hey, I, I got some people stopping by my place this afternoon. Want to come? Andrea didn't need to be asked twice. Yes! It was her anthropologist's dream come true, but she did think briefly about Persephone. I wonder if I should be careful of what I eat. The people that Lynette had over were her mother and three of her mother's friends. She served Diet Coke, sour cream ruffles, and Salem lights that had to be smoked on the deck. Because of the kids. Lynette's mother, Carol, would say, I hear you. Whenever she agreed with something, road, construc sh road construction annoying. I hear you. Early church service too early. I hear you. Carol's friend, Lacey Joe showed up about 20 minutes late. Diet Coke, Lacey Joe. Mm-hmm. Lacey Joe, what's wrong? It's Lacey Joe made a face. It's that damn angel's rest. Lynette leaned over to Andrea. That's the cemetery, the non-Catholic one. Mm-hmm. What's going on? Carol shot Andrea a covert look that said, Now you've started it. Angel's rest is all, excuse my language, all screwed up. My brother earned see his wife and her first husband bought a plot long, long time ago. They even got a stone with their last name on it. Well, Bass, Ern's wife, got divorced 25 years ago, had all that time to change the stone or do something. Well, Ern had the multiple myeloma, you know, because he worked in the pain factory. Bass didn't have a dime, so he ended up under that old stone, under somebody else's name. And I know of four different cases like that, just like that. Paula, who had been quiet until now, raised a finger. And then there's the Norris and girls. Remember how we had that big collection drive at the church? We gave Mamie the money for a marker, but she went to Orlando, and all those girls have is a cement block with the plot number. Lacey Joe took a swig of Diet Coke to fortify herself. Well, I have just found out the worst. Now, you know that secretary over there was Barb Farron before she retired? Well, I guess she did such a terrible job with the files that there is no record over 10 years old. They don't know where anybody is. Could not find them for a million dollars. <laughs> Andrea had dreams that night. She didn't remember the details, but mislabeling was involved. Was I trying to make a cake, but couldn't find the right ingredients? Was I flying a plane with all sorts of unmarked buttons? Huh. Couldn't tell you for a million dollars. Lynette wasn't at the next story time, and Andrea was curiously relieved. But the story time after that, again, no Lynette. She got worried, worried enough, or bored enough, to drive over. Lynette! Lynette was on the couch watching TV. The boys were in the back room. She didn't look like she'd slept recently. She let Andrea in. Are you all right? Andrea was surprised to find that she meant it. Lynette cast a look to the rear of the house. Come outside. Once outside, Andrea assumed Lynette would light up a cigarette. Instead, she reached out and grabbed Andrea's wrist. Is it the boys? Mike's gonna testify against Bobby. Oh. Andrea tried to remember which was Mike and which was Bobby. I don't care about them. But my boys, I mean, they're little now, but in 10 years, Justin is gonna hate Aaron. Just when they need each other most, I don't know what to do. Andrea held it together for an hour and then found an excuse to leave. When she got home, she sat on her front steps and began to cry. All of the tragedies she'd been collecting became real. The insects she pinned to cardboard came alive. 
It rained down a biblical deluge, threatening to drown her. <laughs> the phone ringing from inside brought her to her senses like a more or less friendly slap. Years later, she would tell people, I knew. I just knew, could feel it before I picked up. I was certain that this was a life-changing phone call. In fact, sometimes Andrea would go so far as to tell people that she answered the phone by saying, This is about my husband, isn't it? The following scene is brought to you by Freehold's Engaged Theatre Program. There's Caesar! 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 So, what say ye, soothsayer? The Ides of March have come. Aye, Caesar, but not gone. Why doesn't he listen to the lat lady? He's too proud. He thinks he's all that. Oh, man. Comes that Brutus cat. I kiss thy hand, but not in flattery, Caesar. Desiring thee that Publius Simber may have an immediate freedom of appeal. Oh. Ooh, he's done it now. <laughs> Freehold's Engaged Theater Program brings professional productions of classic texts like Shakespeare to underserved communities around Puget Sound and then follows up with workshops that explore the play's themes. We also host residencies, which allow participants to work with teaching artists to generate and perform their own original work. I could be well moved if I were as you, Brutus. If I could pray to move, prayers would move me. But I am as constant as the Northern Star. I was constant when Simber should be banished, and constant to remain to keep him so. Dumb, dumb, dumb! <laughs> Serving institutions like Harborview Hospital, Echo Glen Children's Center, and the Washington Correctional Center for Women, Engage Theater strives to illuminate the most profound questions of human existence and personal responsibility, allowing both artists and the audience to connect and respond to a larger world. Oh, Caesar! Great. Wilt thou lift up Olympus? Great Caesar! Doth not Brutus bootless kneel? Speak hands for me! They all laugh to stab him? Looks... <laughs> looks like... Et tu, Brute? Then fall, Caesar. Freedom! Liberty! Tyranny is dead! Yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> Tell me about it. To find out more about Freehold's Engaged Theater residencies, tours, and upcoming performances, Google Engaged Theater Seattle. To donate or volunteer your time or services, email Zoe at freeholdtheater.org. Road Trip by Anita Montgomery. 
take the picture. Just hang on a second. Uh, come on, Wendy, uh, just take the... I'm trying to figure out the shuttery thingy, you know, the, what, the aperture thing? Here, just take it, do it, take it with my cell phone. No, this will be much better, better quality. I just haven't used it in a while, oh my God. Stand oh. just a uh, tiny bit to a left, take a step to the left. Come on, what left? My left my or your left? left? Quickly, oh my God, the sun, the view is just... Yeah, I'd love to look at it, but you just got me posing for this fucking picture. Well, never mind. You're gonna start swearing at me. Please, just take the picture. Fine. Done. You're free. Thank you. Wow. It is beautiful. Yeah. The surf's really big, isn't it? Is it? I think so. Seems big for June. I haven't been here in a while, though. I'm trying to remember when. It, it was John and Kelly's wedding? Yatchets. Two years ago? God, you're right. Oh, that was a great vacation, Max. Was... Yeah, yeah, let's go, okay? Okay. You want me to drive? No. I don't think I can pull this off when the whole family thing, I just don't think I can do it. You don't have to do anything, Tommy. It's just my family. They want to see us. They love us. They love you. They love us. They want to see us. No, they want to see you. Me, I'm sure they'd rather not see me. They must hate me. Oh, they do not hate you. Oh, come on. How could they they'd, not? No. You don't think their feelings may have changed just a little bit since we last saw them? What do you mean? You know what I mean. I'm basically responsible for the death of their youngest I grandchild. Nobody thinks that. Why not? I think that. You have got to stop this. I can't be trusted to watch my own kid on please, a fucking playground. Tommy, so how the fuck can I be any it. sort of decent fucking down, husband please. for their daughter? Please, let's not do this. Do okay? what? Grieve our son? No, of course not. Because I really don't know how to not I do am that not right now. About of course, it's not the for. same for you. You weren't. There, Please, you, you don't didn't do this, let okay? him Slow fall down. or down, Tom. hear Tom, him. Tom, Tom, watch so we're the just road. going to waltz into the family room. Tom, stay right. Tom, Tom, stay right. Tom, 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 don't touch me. Okay, right. I'm, I'm staying over here. I'm not moving. I'm sorry. I am so... You are a lunatic. I don't even know you. I know. I know. I'm, I'm sorry. Get, get back in the car. What? You want to kill us now? You're so grief-stricken, you want to bump us off? You see? You, you do think that I killed that him. That is not what I meant. No! I think that's exactly what you what meant. What do you want from me? Do you think you're the only one that's suffering? No, you... Do you think you... you're the only one who lost someone? The only one who doesn't know what to do about it? What to do about anything? No. Please, that's not what I... Please, Wendy, get in the car with me. I feel naked out here. I'm driving now. Give me the keys. Honey! Give me the keys. You are not driving. Okay. Wait a minute. Please, turn off the car. Please, Wendy. I'm... I know I've been a complete mess right now. I know that. I, I'm full of self-pity and self-loathing, but I, I can't stop. I, I can't stop seeing Don't. him. Just please let me talk. I can't stop seeing him fall, seeing him on the ground, and I can't stop blaming myself because I was there. I was right there. I was standing there, and I couldn't do a goddamn thing about it. I am not blaming you. You're not? Really? How can you not? I cannot fathom how you cannot feel anything but complete disgust for me. You are not responsible for what happened. I know that. Maybe in your head, but in your heart. How do you feel? I want to know how you feel. Not much, actually, except for a blinding hot rage at the sheer meaninglessness of this whole thing. But I don't see that rage. Valium, you see lorazepam, me? sometimes in a combination with large quantities of red wine. So we are not coping in the same way, Tommy. I am just trying to put one foot in front of the other. But you are. You you are putting one because foot I'm in- Because I'm not paralyzed? What do you want me to do, Tom? Should I be tearing my hair and wailing? Would that suit you? Of course not. No, no. I, I, I just can't seem to reach into you. You're closed to me. And I, I'm terrified. I'm, I'm fucking terrified that I'll turn around and you'll be gone. Every time you leave the house, I think, oh my God, what if she doesn't come back? What if she gets in a car accident or somebody hurts her or she just doesn't come back to the house because she can't stand my guts anymore because I, because, 
I let our boy die! <laughs> no. Oh, oh, no, Tom. Tommy, no. Oh my god, no, Max! You no. didn't. My god! I don't know what to do! Please, Wendy, I... <laughs> don't leave me, yeah, Wendy. I, I, I don't I'm know not, not what I'd do if you Tom, did. Shh, I'm just sure a basket it's okay, Tommy, case. Tommy, shh. It's, it's okay, honey. It's okay. It's okay. You have to stop beating yourself up. <laughs> when I heard, when the hospital called and told me what had happened after I stood there for a while, when I started to move and come to find you, I wondered why you didn't call me. They told me you were there, and for just a moment, I was so angry with you, as angry as I've ever felt, because I thought I had to hear this news from a nurse in the ER, and not from my own husband. But that only lasted for a second, because I knew I had this premonition. I could see you sitting on a bed, holding him in your arms, and I knew that you couldn't put him down. And I knew that you couldn't bear to tell me, and I knew that they were going to need me to come help you to get you to let him go, because you couldn't do it. And I knew that I would do exactly the same thing because I wouldn't be able to tell you that news either. And when I got to the hospital, that was exactly what was going on. The image that I'd seen of you with Max cradled in your arms was exactly the image that I saw when I walked into that room. It was exactly that image, right down to the color of the blanket you had wrapped around him. It was cream. cream. And I looked at you, and I felt grateful. I felt grateful that it wasn't me who had been on that playground with our son. I felt grateful that it isn't me carrying around the weight that you were carrying because I'm not sure that I could do it. I don't know anything anymore except that I love you with everything I've got left. And don't fall off the roller coaster, okay? <laughs> You're all I've got and I need you to be with me. Come here, come here, come here. Mm. 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 <laughs> wow. Yes, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> wow, that was the slipperiest, most mucusy kiss I've ever had. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. You were pretty they sexy. You were pretty sexy. Yeah. yeah. There's some uh, tissues in the, in the glove box, I think. Excellent. I'm going to drive, okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Babe? Yeah. Um, I love your family. I, I really do. But you'd rather have a root canal than go to this reunion? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, where do you want to go? Um, California, Mexico. <laughs> you got a passport? No. We, we could just drive down the coast to see where we land. All right. Seriously? I don't want to go either. I just thought it was the right thing to do, you know? They invited us. I, I don't know, maybe on the way back. Or what do you know? We'll see them when we see them. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Road trip. <laughs> Can I hold your hand, or will, would that be too dangerous? Mm -mm. Okay, good, good. Radio? Mm -hmm. Okay. You've been listening to Sandbox Radio Live. the Sandbox Artist Collective. For more information about us and how to get the podcast of this show, visit www.thesandboxac.org. We'll see you back here in October for the next live edition of Sandbox Radio. Oh, but wait, oops. Oops, wait, 
Wait, I think I think we forgot something. Did, What's that? Uh, Dan? Dan Tierney? Did, did we forget to say so long? Norman Bell, Christine Marie Brown, Jim Hammond, Sarah Harlett, Victor Janis, Kelly Kitchens, Mick Coleman, Charles Leggett, Todd Jefferson Moore, David Natali, Kate Brian Neal, Annette Tutongi, and Sean John Walsh. With music from the Sandbox Radio Orchestra. Featuring Dan Tierney, Charles Leggett, Dave Pascal, Rob Whitmer, and Jose Juicy Gonzalez. And I'm Leslie Law. So please join us for the next episode of Sandbox Radio Live and more theater for radio reimagined. Annette Tutongi, our card girl, is going to help us out with some lyric cards because now it's time for you to join in and singing so long. Here we go. Sandbox Radio Live was recorded at West of Lennon on June 20th, 2011. It was engineered by Christopher Stewart and mixed by Rob Whitmer. Charles Leggett's poem, Actor's Resume, was first published in the poetry journal Waterways, volume 26, number 7, 2005, out of Staten Island, New York. For more information about the Sandbox Artist Collective, visit thesandboxac.org.